welcome to Jesse Bear Book Club. We like to talk about historical fiction, wild cards, Game of Thrones, and much, much more. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Today I want to talk about Wild Cards 13, Card Sharks. This book was very hard to get a hold of, as there have only been a few print runs of the Card Sharks tirade, so they are rather expensive. I thought I might simply buy a digital copy and print it out like I did for Wild Cards 11, Dealer's Choice, but after asking around about the book I discovered there are no digital copies available, so I had to buy it for £30 which is a lot more than I normally want to spend on a second-hand paperback copy. But I was desperate to read the book, especially since we are still in lockdown and all I want to do is read. The book opens with a fire in the Church of Jesus Christ Joker on Black Queen's Night. The fire was a very gripping read. I felt really sorry for poor Father Squid, I have a soft spot for him, and Quasi-Man was a hero, saving Father Squid's life and the lives of many Jokers in the congregation, However, the fire was so major, most of the people attending the service died. The fire is then investigated by our main protagonist in this book, Hannah Davis, who works for the New York Fire Department and is a typical little woman trying to make it in a big man's world character, trying to prove herself to the New York City Fire Department. What gives her depths is the way her feelings about jokers change throughout the course of the book. Hannah is a small town girl, newly arrived in New York, who has never really had anything to do with aces or jokers before. She is first scared of jokers, but soon learns they are simply people. This new understanding drives a rift between her and her boyfriend David, because he views jokers as subhuman. David is such an ass. Hannah is encouraged by Father Squid and Quasi Man especially to take a deep dive into the church fire investigation and starts uncovering a secret society who plan to eliminate all wild card victims. The book then goes back and forth with Hannah interviewing people every other chapter and learning more and more. The first person Hannah interviews is a joker called Chop Chop, who was created by William F. Wu. Chop Chop meets Fleur Van Rensselaer almost by chance and helps her get an illegal abortion. In exchange, Fleur told him about an arson plot to burn down Joker Town. I loved learning more about Fleur Van Rensselaer, but I was not expecting incest to be the cause of her pregnancy, and finding out the fire plot was decades in the making was pretty mind-blowing. Hannah then goes on to interview Dr. Finn, almost by accident. I loved getting some background on Dr. Finn, I have wanted to learn more about him for ages. His story about being a newly qualified doctor working in Africa, and accidentally infecting Joker children with AIDS, was truly heartbreaking though. What was more shocking was the fact that the higher ups deliberately set up the scheme to infect Joker children with AIDS. Two of the people responsible for the infection program was a nurse named Margaret Durand and a doctor called Etienne Fonelli. Hannah realizes there is much more digging to do in this investigation and goes in search of Ed Thayer, who relates how an ace based space program was scuttled by a conspiracy. This chapter is interesting and boring in equal measure. All the spacecraft and plane stuff bored me to death. I am not mechanically minded, but meeting Mark Meadows' father was interesting, as well as meeting a young Mark. Ed tells his story, and we find out early in the chapter, Margaret Durand and George Battle worked on the space program. We know Battle views aces and jokers as inhuman, and we know from the previous chapter, so does Margaret. And while reading this chapter, I couldn't help wondering if they were working together and we know Margaret was very responsible for the space program with aces going up in smoke. All the first astronauts being aces was a rather interesting idea, but they should have given that more focus, and less page space to jet engines in my opinion. Ed Thayer, who is the protagonist in this chapter, is Joe Bloggs, an average man with a big brain, almost a plot device. Hannah discovers Margaret Durand was last known to be working in Vietnam with Dr. Fernelli, so she gets in touch with the Vietnamese embassy. Chapter 7 I found a bit hard to follow because I have not managed to get my hands on a copy of Wild Cards 12, Turn of the Card, but I soon figured out Mark Meadows is running Vietnam with the help of his friends, and the man Hannah is interviewing, the mechanic, 
is Mart's close friend and political advisor. The mechanic goes on to relate the story of a failed ace rescue mission in Iran starring some of our old favorite aces and organized by the president and the wild card hating George Battle. Jay Aykroyd turns up as part of the rescue group. I love Jay and his one-liners and we also get the real backstory of why Jay Aykroyd doesn't like guns. Jay accidentally shot a child dead in Iran who had a toy gun who Jay thought, because it was dark, was a soldier. A really heartbreaking thing to have happened. We also get to meet a young Billy Ray. I love Billy Ray. He really does have a class coming out of his ass. Any man who wears cowboy boots into battle has my seal of approval, even if he hasn't read Tolkien. I also loved finding out how Billy Ray got his ace name, and how he wanted to be Wolverine, but was worried Marvel would sue him. So the mechanic christened him Carnifex, which means executioner in Latin. I always thought Carnifex was too complicated a name for Billy Ray to have come up with on his own. Lady Black is back. As well, I adore her character and her sharp wit. I really missed her on the rocks. She is one of my favorite aces. We also get to meet some new, very short-lived aces, such as Damsel. I really started liking Damsel, and then she was raped and torn apart by a mob. I honestly thought her ace was an interesting concept. Being able to turn your lover into an ace seems like a very cool thing and something that would be very, very open to abuse. It would have been interesting to get to know her better. This chapter has too much talk about military stuff as well, like guns, but that is only really at the start of the chapter, so I guess they were simply setting the scene. Chapter 9 was really good. Hannah starts coming into her own and she takes the decision to investigate Margaret Durand and Dr. Finelli in Vietnam, and I was glad she finally broke up with David. I really loved seeing Vietnam and Mark Meadows again. I really need to get my hands on book 12. I also loved seeing Croyd, especially half-tiger Croyd and his horny tail that kept going up Hannah's skirt. She discovers Dr. Finelli is dead, and there is nothing on Margaret Durand anywhere. She digs up Dr. Finelli's body and takes his ring as proof that he is dead. Hannah then goes on to interview Croyd about Dr. Pan Rudu, almost by accident, and who doesn't love some Croyd Crenson mischief? I kept wondering about how Croyd ages, and I did the math. This book was set in 1993, and working from Croyd's age in 1946 when the virus hit, he would be 60 years old during this book. That's pretty old. To still be getting up to all these hijinks on speed. The Nazi Dr. Rudo has intrigued me from the start of the Rock's tirade. I really like Rudo's idea about life lies and how we all tell ourselves lies to deal with life, but it is the level of lying that is important. I found this chapter was building up to something sinister, and I was apprehensive to keep reading, but I was glad Croyd got out of everything unhurt. But I knew Rudo was trouble and knowing he thinks wildcard victims are human garbage makes him working at the Joker Town Clinic pretty shady and dangerous. My favorite part of this chapter was when Croyd, after a deep sleep, pretends to the ex nazi doctor that he is an old partner from back in World War II. Rudo is tricked and gives up a bit of personal information about his history. After interviewing Croyd, Hannah goes back to America to continue her search for evidence of a plot against wildcard victims. Father Squid recommends they talk to Cameo, because Hannah has Dr. Finelli's ring, and of course Cameo is linked to battle because of the rocks. But it turns out Cameo tells them Finelli is not dead, and she knows much, much more. They meet at Cameo's club Dead Nicholas, and we see that Quasiman has a sense of humour and it makes him much more human and less of an abstract character that pops in and out. We also find out in this chapter that since the rocks, masks have come back into fashion in Joker Town. I find this really ironic because it is lockdown and we are all wearing masks right now. Chapter 12 has Cameo channeling Nikki, the P.I. secret Hollywood ace, trying to make sure the movie Blythe gets made in about 1965. It would have been the first major movie to focus on wildcard issues if it got made. This chapter is extremely sad. Kevin Andrew Murphy gives Nikki's character so much depth 
it hurt to read all the horrible things that happened to him. I really like how Kevin Andrew Murphy writes old Hollywood. It reminds me of the TV show Rivals, about Bette Davis and Joan Crawford, but set in the wildcard universe. I don't like the fact Kevin killed Liz Taylor. I much prefer Liz Taylor to Marlon Monroe, who is heavily featured in this chapter. I think Liz Taylor is a better actress, but that's personal opinion. I think Kevin might have a crush on Marla Monroe from the way he writes about her in this chapter. We find out early in this chapter, Pan Rudo is Marla Monroe's personal doctor, and he is keeping her well doped up. We also find out Rudo is experimenting a lot with psychedelic drugs during the 60s. I didn't think Rudo would be an LSD man, but I also didn't think Marla Monroe would sleep with Dr. Rudo as part of her so-called therapy. So this chapter really fleshes out Pan Rudo's personality. This chapter is the one that brings all the strings together, showing the full extent of the card shark's plot, and having Hedda Hopper as queen pin was genius. There are too many card sharks even to try and name, and that is a scary idea. Poor Nicky, he is such a likeable, well-meaning character, but perhaps a little naive. I was expecting him to fall in love with Marlon Monroe, but I was not expecting him to get her pregnant, and then her kill him to keep the card sharks happy. That was a twist I was not expecting. Especially discovering Marlon, whether willing or unwilling, has been working for the card sharks in some way since the mid-sixties. The saddest part of this chapter, however, is discovering that Cameo is in love with Nikki, who died long before she was born and that is why she named her club Dead Nicholas. That is the most depressing, goth thing I have ever heard. After interviewing Cameo, Hannah gets shot in Jokertown while drunk, but she is okay. As she is lying in her hospital bed, David comes to visit her and tells her it is a warning. She needs to stop the hunt for the card sharks, and she finally figures out he is in on the conspiracy. I figured it out in chapter four, so it took her long enough. But the most surprising thing in this chapter is finding out the wild card's old enemy, Burnett, is president. Scary stuff. Hannah refuses to stop the hunt for the card sharks and tells David. He leaves and then a nurse tries to kill Hannah, which proves how well organized the card sharks are. Hannah and Quasiman escape, returning to stay with Father Squid, and then the Van Rensselaer family turn up again, Brandon this time and we find out his estranged wife is a half-snake joker who agrees to tell Hannah everything she knows about the card sharks. We then get a chapter from the perspective of Lamia, formerly Joanne Van Rensselaer, and she talks about her diagnosis with the wild card, her family, and her husband's affair with Marlon Monroe. Dr. Rudo turns up again at a party attended by the Van Rensselaers and Marlon Monroe and it makes me feel like maybe Marlon really does hate jokers if she continued to associate in such circles. I love the fact Greg Hartman turns up to manipulate Brandon and Joanne mid-party. It is a great little easter egg. The chapter implicates Brandon in the assassination of Robert Kennedy, which Joanne discovers and the stress of which causes her wildcard to express. The scene where she eats her dog after becoming half snake is hard to read and I can't help wondering who Joanne's boyfriend at the Joker Town Clinic is. My guess is Troll. I can't see it being Dr. Finn. In the final chapter, Hannah confronts Marlin in a hotel room with Nikki's murder. Marlin appears remorseful about killing Nikki and gives Hannah the evidence Nikki gave her to keep safe about the card sharks he had gathered from Hedda Hopper. I honestly don't believe Marlin when she claims she was too scared to act and I feel she bears a lot of responsibility and a lot of blood is on her hands because she didn't act. I feel Marlon is playing both sides off each other and has been doing so for a long time. Hannah finally meets Dr. Rudo in the hotel lobby and they fight over the incriminating evidence and he threatens to kill her someday soon. The story is left very open-ended. You discover the book has been a letter that will be sent to Greg Hartman to seek his help in destroying the card sharks, and I can't wait to see some puppet man. I didn't think we saw enough of him in the rocks tirade, and I am very excited to see what will happen and if his powers will come back. I really enjoy this book. 
I thought our main protagonist, Hannah, was a little dull. She is really just a storytelling mechanism. Putting Marilyn Monroe in the story was a stroke of genius because it makes the plot slightly more grounded in reality. Well, as grounded as a wild card universe book can be. I also really enjoyed meeting new POV characters like Chop Chop, Lamia, and especially Nikki. Before I finish this review, however, I want to talk about the amazing cover art on this book by Barclay Shaw. So far, these have been the best cover arts of any of the wildcard books, in my opinion. They make Hannah Davis a bit too sexy, and she doesn't wear the blue jumpsuit until Wild Old Cards 14, but I guess I have to sell books. A friend of mine saw me reading this book and asked me if it was a raunchy spy novel from the cover. I thought that was quite funny. I also love the burning church in the background of the book and the portrayal of Quasi Man. The only problem I have with this cover is Father Squid. When I first seen it, I assumed it was Xavier Desmond from the picture. This is not the way I thought Father Squid would look. I always pictured him looking more like Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. But we all have our own imaginations and can picture people however we like. I give this book 8 out of 10. Some parts are a little dull and too focused on military stuff for my liking but in general, it is a great opening to a great story. But what do you think? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. And as always, this is just my opinion. Please remember to help out and like this video if you enjoyed it. You can also follow me on Instagram at Lady Jessica Riddell and on Twitter at Jessums. I post on Twitter regularly about my videos. If you want to see more book reviews, character comparisons, and fan theories, please subscribe to Jessie Bear Book Club. I try to post a new video at least once a week. See you next time on Jessie Bear Book Club. Bye!